Personally, I am interested in the origins of art. Where, where does art come from? Where does the imagination come from? And um, in that, uh, the person who first uh, inspired me, uh, I thought a lot about him, is a poet and painter called William Blake. And you know, he distinguished his first series of uh, two famous series of poems were poems about innocence and poems about experience. And he had a lot to say about the relationship of innocence to experience. A, a child is innocent, but he felt that a child uh, doesn't come as a kind of tabula rasa, uh, a kind of uh, a, a, a clean uh, piece of uh, slate. Doesn't come like that. A child comes with a whole tradition of wisdom. A child is wise. And an adult needs, in order to be creative, to discover the child within. So it's not as though here you have a child, here you have an adult, here's somebody who is learning, here is somebody who is teaching. But you have this process which is going on in the child and also in, in me as an adult of trying to understand, first of all, a wisdom which is something which I didn't actually get in school. I got knowledge in school, but not wisdom. Wisdom came separately. Uh, that wisdom is something which comes from, you could say, the whole history of mankind. So a child has this wisdom, the wisdom of being a human being. And we quite often, mainly because of our education, we forget this wisdom and we have to rediscover it by rediscovering our childhood. childhood. And that is the playfulness. At a certain period, you could say, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, there was a, a realization that inspiration would come from returning to the origins of art. The discovery of uh, primal roots of art was paralleled by a discovery of child art. Uh, even people like Clay at the Bauhaus, he was a teacher of, of, of small children before he, uh, he discovered himself as an artist. And he, he found that in the painting of small children, there was a vitality which he wanted to rediscover. So, um, so here you get a valuing of a kind of art which in many schools, you know, the teacher begins by the idea, these children don't know how to draw, they don't know how to paint. I have to teach them. Teach them what? Put on the board, this is a flower pot, this is a flower <laughs> coming out of it, you know? And so, in the process, completely kill uh, off that uh, wellspring of inspiration which is part of their wisdom. Now I think that what I felt about the kind of vision of Kabir was that um, it, it somehow went back to something primordial. Kabir himself may have uh, said that he was illiterate ink or paper I never touched, nor did I take a pen to hand. The greatness of the four ages I have described by word of mouth. So he is supposed to be illiterate, he is supposed to be a Dalit, a person who only works with his hands in the social system, considered to be not one of the intellectuals, not one of the people who have inherited the uh, great culture. And yet he can draw on a kind of wisdom which is present in the roots, in the folk tradition, in the working tradition. Our classroom, as we understand it, the way in which we take, teach, 
goes back in a sense to Descartes. It goes back to an understanding that uh, a child has got a mind, we have discussed this already, and a body. And the purpose of education is to somehow get the child to leave their bodies and develop their minds. So this is the wound. This is the wound of the Cartesian classroom. Uh, a uh, uh, educationist uh, has said, in Western education, the highest status is reserved for the most abstract and immaterial learning, irrespective of its utility, and the lowest status is accorded to concrete materialistic learning, much of which we learn in daily embodied action. Entering the classroom, determined to erase the body and give ourselves more fully to the mind, we show by our being how deeply we have accepted the assumption that passion has no place in the classroom. So, so this idea that uh, you get them all to sit on chairs, rooted, uh, you know, on the thing, not to move about, the ruler in hand. You have to sit still, you have to learn things only with the mind. And that is the wound. So, I think that uh, what we are trying to find uh, in working with children is a kind of what may, maybe Aurobindo called an integral yoga. An integral yoga in which uh, these two elements, the body and the mind, uh, are not seen as uh, uh, fighting each other, but in a sense working together to create a wholeness. A person who I have uh, gained a lot from is a, is a a philosopher, a phenomenologist called Gaston Bachelard. And he said that um, actually what a poet is looking at, he called it the material imagination. The material imagination is <coughs> that a poet is experiencing phenomena in the same way that a scientist is. In the, in the Cartesian classroom, or the Cartesian University, we have the arts on one side and the sciences on the other. But knowledge is not really like that. Knowledge uh, is something in which uh, the way in which we are looking at things as a scientist or a mathematician is looking is not different from the way in which a poet looks at it. So this was the argument that, that our concepts of space and time actually are both uh, objective, but they include the subject. This comes back to, to modern science, which uh, you could say uh, says that our subjective way of seeing determines uh, our objective, uh, what we see, David Bohm and people like that. Uh, that is to say that um, that science, we can't just be objective. Uh, in the same way as we can't just experience, we can't just have uh, a, a experience without the baggage, which I spoke of earlier. Uh, the same is true of science. Science carries a baggage also. And uh, so every scientist is actually looking at the external world from a cultural, poetic background. And that is the origin of language. Language, uh, the way in which we describe something, even if we were describing an external phenomena, that language is not something which human beings have made, but which has made human beings. We are determined by the language which we use. Uh, that's, that gives a, a kind of the symbols which we used. Uh, it, it's not that, that the poet sits down and invents symbols. No. The symbols are something which possess the poet. So uh, I have uh, uh, tried to relate this to uh, some of the ideas which I have found inspiring in the poetic tradition of Kabir. Here is a 
a form that had a small child, but the child has said, this is a house. It's not a house as you would look at it uh, objectively like a camera, but it is a space which is a home, a place to inhabit. Going backwards, when children paint a house, whether they are in a village in India or whether they are in Europe or wherever they are, they make a house like that. So uh, some people will say it is archetypical. Archetypical means the, this house is not just the external house, it doesn't look like the house where they were brought up, but it's an inner house, a house of the heart, and it looks like a face. The two uh, uh, windows are eyes, and they often have stars in them, and the door is the mouth. And here again, you get this house, but it is a, a cosmic house. And it is the, the child is inhabiting a space which is not only related to the factual uh, house from which they come, whether it's a rich child or whether it is a poor child, a child coming from a very simple home or a child coming from a block of flats in Bangalore, they make such a picture. So it is that inside us there is a cosmic home. And this home is the you could say Shunya, Shikha, uh, this is the, the and these are the sun and the moon, the stars. Uh, this is this is as it were the universe, the universe which is our home. Uh, we can't force this. So it it is something uh, the, this imagination comes from within. It's not something you can teach. We can teach other subjects, we can teach calculus, but we cannot teach imagination. I la laugh when I hear that, if, that the fish in the water is thirsty. You do not see the real is in your home and you wander from forest to forest listlessly. Here is the truth. Go where you will to Banaras or Mathura. If you do not find your soul, the world is unreal to you. So here again, would get uh, the, what is being spoken of here is that inner hope, that inner sense of belonging, which is linked also to what was discussed at the first day, a sense of identity, a sense of, uh, of having a name, a sense of uh, of belonging some, and that all comes at the same time. Even the even this thing of very small children refer to themselves in the abstract, mm. huh? but a point comes when they say I, mm. and that point when the child says I is also a point when symbolism starts. Language takes on. So the home is a space which is there are related areas related rooms. They are seen almost from above. You get uh, even in, in folk art, in Wadli painting and so on, or, <coughs> or uh, even in Egyptian painting. The, the image of the house is seen above as a plan, not in elevation. So here are the people, the family, mother and father, children, and these are the rooms of the house. Even the windows open outwards. Next one. And so <clears throat> here is a bus. Uh, it's, it, these people who have entered the bus, uh, the wheels, can you see the wheels on this side? So <clears throat> it is a concept of the bus, but it's, it's a different understanding of a vehicle from the one which, uh, which has been introduced by uh, the Cartesian classroom. It is what we are calling self-discovery is actually something poetic. It's part of poetry. And it's part of this sense of belonging to the cosmos, belonging to trees, belonging. It's not the kind of I which is alienated from the rest of creation. So that is, is a, an intuition 
which is we think that it's a very abstract idea, nirguna, idea of mystics and so on, but it is the original vision of a child. That a child, in that sense, has the same view of reality as the mystic. The mystic is only returning to the child. So it is important that we don't think that when teaching Kabir or something, we have to simplify it. Oh, this person is very, uh, a very advanced mind. Children won't understand it. They won't be able to think like that. The problem is not children. The problem is adults. So uh, there is no need to simplify Kabir. Uh, what we have to do is to understand Habib, we have to become like children. The next uh, picture, so here again, you get this person who is already, in, in a certain sense, uh, a cosmic person, a person who is, is not just the individual as we understand it in a consumer society, but this is a person who discovers the whole in themselves, universe within. That is the intuition. Uh, I and my wife and also my son uh, worked on a book called Education Through Art. The real problem was not with the children, we, we documented that, but with the teachers. They said, how can you say that this is good art? Uh, we have to try and educate the children not to paint like this. You see? And yet, uh, this in itself is art. Right? That is a kind of uh, understanding which is often difficult to communicate to teachers. Next picture. So, here is a bird. The bird is already present in this. Space. So the egg is the enclosing space, this is present in many cosmologies, uh, and the bird breaks from this space and comes out and is able to fly. This is like the child in the womb which has to come out, and that is, is, is the first wound. We are born out of a wound. I, I sometimes uh, feel that, uh, you know, watching, say, singers, singing Kabir songs. Uh, the song is a kind of cry. Yeah? I remember once uh, somebody said to me, it must be nice to be an artist because then you will see everything is very beautiful. You are a very joyful person. I said, well actually, to be very honest, quite often when I paint, I cry. Literally cry. So the, the painting the image uh, comes out of a kind of suffering. It's not, uh, uh, and even a child, when it's born, it's sucked, it has to cry. Why? Because only from crying will it breathe. So our cry, that primordial, that is the resounding shabd of the universe, that cry is the cry which is related to breath, which is related to a certain kind of suffering. Next one. So out of that, coming, birthing out of that house, this person is discovering all this God. Okay, it's the visual, uh, the image gives rise to the story. In fact, uh, uh, there is a phenomenologist called Paul Ricoeur, and he says, the image is not the result of thought, but thought is the result of the image. Image gives rise to thought. So it's not there that the child has thought, I'm going to do this. But having done this, they discover the story. And they discover, so the whole story comes from these primordial images which lie in the heart and which now become a thought process, and the thought process is through the story. Uh, here again, the relation of the human to the tree. The human being has branches, and so this sense, I am a tree, I am a house, I am a garden, all these are present in the 
poetic tradition of Kabir, but they lie at the root of the imagination in Kabir Chai. They are not something which is foreign to the child. So the child is dreaming. And I think that what is interesting about the uh, poem is that it helps in dreaming. The poet, the poet is the dreamer, the cultural dreamer. And it helps in a kind of reverie. And it's important because uh, this kind of imagery comes out of a certain kind of loneliness. Unless a child is alone, unless a child begins to dream and daydream alone, their mind will never be alone. And so the trouble with our Cartesian home, or our Cartesian classroom, it doesn't allow children to be alone. It doesn't allow them to dream. They're all the time busy, 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 and this affects the mind. Let's go to this, the singing part. We tried to think of the dance drama uh, from this, um, trying to take the story in its archetypal sense, images of fire and the forest, images which are dream images. Uh, this was the stage in the garden uh, using forms, the, the the patterns on the ground were also supposed to relate to movement. Next. And so preparing uh, masks for the children. They are now, a child is going to become alive. Then it is a type of possession. Mask is central to ancient uh, ritual shamanistic traditions. Because when a person wears a mask, they enter into a new character. They are no longer this person who is called so and so. They now become an animal. They become a bird. They become uh, something else. And that transformation is possible through the story and through drama. So here, uh, the bird is flying, and then the trees are the person becomes the tree. So. Uh, the, the animals feeling afraid, running away from uh, the fire uh, and the bird uh, wanting to fly. How do, we, how do we experience in ourselves a sense of flying? Much of dancing is about relating to the cosmos, relating to fire, relating to water, relating to flying, relating to the earth. Dance is that, to discover in our own body the element. Next, there is, a, you know, in the seasons, we, we, we have the idea of the hot season, which is related to fire, then the rainy season, and then uh, water falling, the tears, uh, and then a, a new fruitfulness coming. This is an experience of the cycle of the seasons. And so, finally, this sense of uh, love and compassion between the bird and the tree. So that kind of sense, compassion, what is compassion? Compassion is a sense of belonging to nature, of belonging to those who are suffering, of, of identity. Uh, identity not as a separate thing, but in drama, in, in dance, of identifying with the other. Uh, that is compassion. So we, we, we tend to think of identity only as separate identity. But what the story, the dance and the movement does, it says that we discover our identity by becoming the other. One of the basic ideas from the Jatakas, running through all of them, is the concept of karuna, of compassion. So this goes in many of the stories, basically, that the Buddha is one who is compassionate, who uh, feels for the suffering of others. And so that is then what is present in this parrot story also. It is compassionate. There is a whole tradition in India of the yogic body. 
cool art came out of it. It's probably uh, considered to be probably originally uh, tribal art, tantric art, we call it tantric art. Don't go to the gardens outside, don't go. Your body itself contains a bar and bloom. We have done many of these images in the second day, which I found very helpful in understanding that the body itself is the universe. The body is the, the whole world. body is the sky. Everything is in the body. Now that is a yogic idea. Uh, Kabir obviously drew many of his concepts from yoga. So, so in teaching, uh, the body the body is not just here inside, but it's also our relation to the environment. So uh, certain kind of environmental ideas link the body to uh, the whole world in which we live, the oikos. Next picture. So these are traditional Jain, Hindu, Buddhist ideas of the body with the different chakras, the body understood as itself, uh, a mandala in which there are these different, it comes over and over again in Kabi, the, the, the different doors of the body, the body is itself a temple, carry on. Uh, so uh, it is uh, this whole tradition of the yogic body is something which is present in uh, in the poetry of Kabir and could be expanded, could be, as it were, introduced. Uh, I know even in the school which my wife is running, trying to get children to do some yoga in the morning and relating that. There's a nice book written by somebody in Veradu, uh, Yoga for Children. And there, many of the asanas are connected, you might say, with a snake, with a tiger, with, the, with some animal, yeah? So, you, through yoga, you discover that you are not only your body, but you are related to the animal world, to nature, to the forms of trees, etc. So that's something children like to discuss, uh, to experience. I am a tree, I am a snake. So you can say that uh, yoga is another uh, way, not only of doing exercises, but relating somehow to the whole universe. It's not just a matter of ecological crisis we are going through. We are going through an educational crisis. Behind the ecological crisis is an education. It's no point just telling people, oh, don't do this, don't do that don't uh, cut trees, don't uh, use energy in a bad way, uh, try and uh, be more e uh, ecologically okay. conscious. This will not work unless our education changes. So if we are imagining changing uh, the problems, the crisis which we are facing, it's not anything else than an educational problem.